Thank you. Wow. We both score high on arrogance, so it was really important what Roma did there. Uh, we fought it, but you know, not that hard. Yeah. Um, so it's my fourth trip back. Uh, really great to be back. I'm honored. Um, and it's a privilege to uh, have Bill here for the first time. We've been um, partners in crime for 10, 12 years now, uh, working this out together. Um, I can honestly say about Bill that uh, he's one of the best consultants I know in terms of application of this stuff, if not the best, and uh, I've learned a lot from him. And, and more importantly, we're partners, we're co-authors, and we're really, really good friends. And that's saying a lot. You know what it takes to run a business and have a business grow in the kind of pressures and stuff that can put on you. And uh, through all that, we've forged a really um, amazing relationship. So it's really it's great to be with you. Good to be with you, Bob. Uh, first of all, I'm grateful to be here. Um, worked in and out of Australia and out of Asia Pacific for about 25 years. And so uh, the other day, I knew that I'd been traveling way too much when I was flying last week from Washington, D.C., back to my home in Salt Lake City, and uh, the uh, uh, flight attendant was thanking all the million milers. And the million milers were all being thanked. And then the flight attendant said, and we'd like to thank the one uh, five million miler that is on the plane today. And uh, David Spock, who is one of our partners, to me, said, who do you think that is? And I said, me. <laughs> and uh, so I have had a good experience working around the world in uh, about 30 years and very, very much appreciated. And I uh, had that experience uh, this time of how far you are away from home. Uh, when you're on the other side of the world, because my uh, oldest daughter, I uh, want to do a little shout out to her, given we're streaming and she's watching, uh, had twins on uh, Monday uh, at 33 weeks. And so we went through that experience of hoping everything was going to be okay, and I'm happy to report that we have two new baby girls, uh, both around five pounds and both doing very, very well this morning. So I'm coming in. Uh, yeah, thank you. Um, I uh, told Aubrey when I was talking to her last night, I said, you know, this is that point in uh, experience as a man where I say, uh, I think I should say I have empathy for what you're going through, but I actually have no idea. <laughs> and I realize that's more important, more important to understand now than it ever has been. So really glad to be here. The uh, conversation that we're going to have today on the leadership circle profile and this leadership model is we'll start out and uh, Bob's going to give us an introduction to the profile. We're going to walk through it and we're going to be playing back and forth with each other in a really big way. So we've given each other permission to interrupt the other and uh, we're going to work at interrupting each other without it being a distraction to you. However, if it gets to be a distraction, just tell us and we'll work at it again. So we'll do that. Uh, part of the reason that we're going to do that is because uh, what we're going to share with you today is a study that uh, is hot off the press. So uh, literally, the research was completed about uh, two weeks ago. And we've been working that data ever since to really get ready for it. And that's going to take the bulk of the conversation. We'll walk through that. That'll take us up to about uh, the break. And after we get back from break, we're going to take the study and we're going to put a developmental lens on it so that we can understand how it is that what we've learned, it's a qualitative study, can actually be looked at through a lens of development. And what does it mean to development specifically of leaders? And then we'll talk about that, and then we'll finish it up with a case study. The study we did, which I am really excited about, is we took uh, and did a massive download of our written comments and then looked at it from the perspective of what are leaders teaching us about leadership as they evaluate each other. And that's the study. But to get really understand it and how it all relates to our framework, we want to go through the leadership circle. Some of you are new to this, so we want to just quickly go through it. So whether you, many of you know that I, sp I, got, I was lucky in my career, actually, fortunate. I spent the first uh, years very closely connected to thought leaders in the field and um, had the good fortune of working closely with them and then dove into the literature and the research. And this was my experience in the field, a random collection of really great stuff. Great models, great theory, frameworks, completely unintegrated. And I don't know why. I, don't, I think either craziness or, or, or why I'm supposed to be on this planet, I set out to integrate it. 
And to, that took 20 years. And over a 20 year period of time, the puzzle pieces started to knit together. And uh, when that happened, I built the Leadership Circle Profile in the uh, late 90s, early 2000s. So in about that point when Bob was finishing the profile, uh, we'd been in a business where for the better part of 20 plus years, the majority of our work was partnering with very senior leaders in anywhere from mid-size to very large corporations in business transformation. And when we got into the business transformation uh, 25 years ago now or so, uh, transformation was one of those words that you sort of had to whisper because people were afraid of it. I uh, don't want to talk about transformation. Now we're dealing with the same thing when we talk about consciousness. When we talk about consciousness and mindfulness and all of a sudden there's this little bit of a jittery act, that's where we were with transformation. A significant portion of that work, as all of you that are involved with it, and most of us are in some sort of transformative experience now, was focusing on the leadership system and how it was that that system had to transform both individually and collectively in order for the organization to actually do the kind of transformation or take on the kind of transformation that was going to be sustained, both business and cultural. So we are going along and we were not pleased at that stage, even the work we are doing, uh, with the leadership model we were using. We just didn't feel like we had a model or a process that went as deep as we needed it to to do the work with transformation that we are looking at. And we asked one of our researchers to go out and see if there was anything in the field. And if there was something in the field, let's take a look at it. And if not, God forbid, we're going to create one ourselves. Another model of leadership was exactly what we thought the world needed at that point on top of the other 10,000 models that can you Google and now get 150,000. Out of the research, 60 days later, popped Bob Anderson in uh, Ohio, Toledo, Ohio, for heaven's sakes. And I'm uh, thinking, you got to be kidding me, a model in Toledo, Ohio, I'm not sure that, well, Let's find out. <laughs> and we jumped in, and within about 45 days, we went as a firm from being tool agnostic to tool advocates, and from model agnostic to model advocates. And when I really uh, got deep into it, went through certification with Bob, we took our whole team, my experience was the following. At the end of day one of certification, for those that have you been through, I looked at Bob and I said, I believe that you have created the only fully integrated model of leadership that I've seen. I think you've created the only fully, mo fully integrated model of leadership that I've seen in the field. And at that point, the rest is history for us, and we've been working that model and working with our clients ever since in the last 12 years. When That's how we came that, together. When he said that to me, it about knocked me over because I really didn't know what I was up to consciously. And um, so it was just like, Wow, and so this is the model. The, this, we lay results out in a circle, and the circle is a drawing of the model, and we're going to do a quick run through on that so we can unpack the study in relationship to this framework. So notice that the top half of the model says uh, creative and reactive. Now this ties to all the research that comes out of the adult development field on stages of adult development. And many of you are familiar with that, either Robert Keegan's work or Susan Cook Gruder's work. The basic notion here is that adults can evolve, can evolve if they evolve, and that's a big if, from one operating system to the next to the next, just like we've experienced with DOS, Windows, Windows 10. And the internal consciousness Meaning-making system, operating system can go through a reconstruction into higher order complexity of mind and form, and when that happens, um, we're more effective. So the model points to stages of adult development. It doesn't, in the assessment, does not measure adult development. It points to the stage of development. And the key in here, from my perspective, is where Bob started with this add to it. Adults, if they choose, can develop. Adults, if they choose, can develop. So adult development at some stage as we start to grow through adulthood and become more and more mature becomes a choice. And we all know that experience of either making that choice or seeing others make that choice where we start to take ourselves on and start to look at that transformative process individually and what that means to the way we show up in the world. And so it's a structure. I like the metaphor of an operating system. We talk about consciousness as the inner game. Um, and it's a structure, and structure determines performance. Um, 
Consciousness is a structure just like an operating system, and as it evolves, it gets different levels of performance. So with each leap step evolution in the uh, underlying operating system, you can do more with less. You can get, take on more complex tasks or challenges with greater creativity, agility, and so on. Innovation, um, and that's the principle. And it turns out adults can do the same thing. And so the top half, so, and so if that's the case, then we should see it in the research. So we did a, a study with Notre Dame University. We put 90 managers through both the leadership circle profile assessment and the best assessment that we could find out there on which operating system are you running, a stage of development assessment. We used the MAP assessment. Some of you are familiar with Susan Gruder's work to measure stage of mind. And so these should correlate. And we have a measure of leadership effectiveness on our leadership circle profile, and this is what we found. Those leaders who are running what we call reactive mind, and most adults are operating at this level of mind, had average effectiveness scores at the 40th percentile compared to our norm group. Our norm group now is about 700,000 surveys, and so these uh, reactive leaders are just below the norm at the 40th percentile. Those who tested out having a, rea a creative level mind had effectiveness scores at the 65th percentile, and those that were at the 90th percentile, uh, who had uh, integral level mind, which is a very complex and high order operating system, had leadership effectiveness scores at the 90th percentile. And so when we play with this and we think about that major transition between reactive and creative, and obviously the science is getting better, but it's still a science that's got some art to it, maybe 70% of the adult population operates in the reactive, 15 to 20% in the creative. The point of transition between reactive and creative is when I start to be more authored by self than I am by others. So the socialized mind, authored by others, then I'm dependent upon what's going out in the world and what it is you think of me and how it is that you think I'm showing up and less dependent upon or integrated with what's important to me. So the difference between being authored by self and being authored by others. Great, and that's the profile. So the vertical axis on the profile is stage development. And so the top half, creative, bottom half, reactive. We go from the reactive creative to the horizontal with relationships on one side and task on the other. And this goes back to the very basic research that came out of uh, Ohio State in the early 50s on task and socio-emotional. So in other words, what's going on? What are we trying to accomplish from a task perspective? And how are we doing with relationships? I was teaching this stuff 30 years ago, right? And uh, now I'm just realizing that I'm just starting to get it in a way that I didn't 30 years ago. So that forms the grid. Got to have one of these to be legitimate in business, all right? One of these kind of presentations. Everybody's got to have at least grid, one four square. Right? But this is actually how it works. You can lead task creatively or reactively. Creatively on purpose, vision, strategy, execution, reactively you drive uh, and as we'll see in the comments, micromanage, overpower, overcommit, and so on. Uh, there can be a, both task-oriented, both are skilled or really task-capable, uh, but they get very different results. So yeah. task on the right-hand side of the horizontal can be either be reactive or creative. We go to relationship on the other side, and we look, and it can be both reactive and or creative, one or the other. Yeah, the kind that brings out or empowers people, brings out the best in people, mentors, develops, or uh, plays too small, cautious, careful, um, gives up too much power, down here, power, to get results. The opposite quadrant in the upper half. And so this is the, pa this is the dynamic we're gonna see in the profile, and it's the dynamic in the, uh, you'll see it all over the comments. It's really interesting. So, um, Top half of the circle up here in the outer circle, 18 key competencies highly researched to be um, uh, correlated to leadership effectiveness and business results. And those fall into five buckets. First bucket over here on the task side is achieving. Right? How do you really, ach high achievement results? Work on the other side, the bucket here on relating. Uh, on the relationship side is relating. So over here is how you redesign systems for higher order performance. 
systems thinker and so on. And over here, how I'm showing up and whether or not my self-awareness is high. Where am I on self-awareness? And how authentic am I? High integrity, courageous authenticity, and so on. And so that's the, the top half of the circle. And it turns out that those 18 key competencies, when, when averaged together, are highly correlated to leadership effectiveness. So we have a scale on the survey that is a measure of leadership effectiveness. And it's questions, these are the five questions. Uh, so if you just look at the top one and the bottom one, overall I'm satisfied with the quality of leadership that he or she provides. Overall he or she provides very effective leadership. Gives you a measure of how effectively you're being experienced as a leader. And then when we correlate that with the scores and the, the average score in the top half, we get a correlation of 0.93. Right? Now it doesn't get any better than that in this kind of research. And basically it, it says that if you can improve your scores in the top half of that circle, you're going to be experienced as a uh, more effective leader. And very likely that that's so. So we look at that on the reactive side. And on the reactive side, on the bottom half, uh, the research on the same thing shows us that all of a sudden on the leadership effectiveness scale, when you take those five questions, on the reactive side, we start to get a negative correlation. The more reactive I am, the more my reactive shows up, the less effective I am as a leader. And so here's the way we define reactive. Strengths run from a reactive structure of mind. This is different, and we're going to see this all over the comments. When you run your strengths reactively, they have liabilities associated with it, and it can be significant liabilities, and we'll look at that. And really key in here, so when you look at the reactive with controlling all those dimensions, protecting and complying, on the bottom half, uh, what we know is that there are significant strengths associated with those. There's a strength associated with being able to set clear direction and have people buy in and understand it. There's a strength associated with being in relationship and complying and being able to get along. There's a strength associated with keen intelligence that can lay things out. Those are all associated. However, when I take those strengths and over-rely upon them and run them on a reactive structure, then they actually can turn against me instead of for me. And so if you're following this, you want to see strong scores in the top half of the circle, right? Strong scores in the top half of the circle. And the way we draw them is they radiate out from center. Strong scores extend further from center. The green is the average score from others, like a bar chart extending out. And the uh, dark line is the self score. So a perfect profile would look like this. High creative, low reactive, this would be ideal. And this is where we actually got this profile. We asked 50,000 leaders around the world to describe ideal leadership. Where we, and the question we asked was, what's the kind of leadership that if it existed in your organization would allow the organization to thrive in its current marketplace and into the future? And this is the picture we get almost every time. Every time, whether we ask individuals, whether we ask teams, whether we ask the organization. This optimal profile shows up each so, and every time. So we all know leadership's important, and we all know what it looks like. And this is critical, because uh, most organizational cultures don't look like this. <laughs> no understatement there, right, Bob? <laughs> Okay, so the last thing We're not piece, running out of clients right now. That's, uh, that's uh, absolutely key. The last thing we did was we, did put a, we created a metric. We want to see how this relates to business performance. So we created a metric of business performance. And we asked managers to evaluate the performance of the business, not the person, but the business, on some metrics like market share, uh, profitability, return on assets, quality of products and services, and overall business performance, and so on. We created a business index. We correlated that with leadership effectiveness. And this is the picture we get. Good, strong, solid correlation between business performance and leadership effectiveness. Duh. I mean, uh, but, th but uh, then we got really curious about this study and we said, I wonder what the aggregate leadership circle profile would look like of the businesses that were rated as highest performing. Do you guys get the question? Well, we couldn't resist the second question. What's the aggregate business performance look like of businesses that were underperforming? And this is what we found. Of the leaders, in the, of the, the organizations that were rated as underperforming had a uh, aggregate leadership culture that looked like this. So bottom profile here, lowest 
we're talking about 10% on business performance, here's the profile. And then we change that around and look at the, there we go, let's go back to the top. We look at the top 10%, this is what the profile looks like. So bottom 10%, go back. I got that, it takes me like three or four times, somewhere around there. You should see how I do on names. Top 10%. So all of a sudden we're taking a look at this and we're saying to ourselves, wait a minute, um, are we potentially getting on the line of being able to show that leadership actually has a direct impact on the performance of a business or an organization? Because we talk about it all the time, but we haven't necessarily drawn the direct line correlation cause and effect that if I'm more effective as a leader, then my business is gonna perform better. And I'm less effective, my business is gonna perform less effectively, or my organization, depending on the for-profit or not-for-profit. And that's where we start to really play with the notion that leadership effectiveness and business performance are important together. They're equally important. And so if you, uh, then we just look again at the, the, the uh, effectiveness scores on that same sample and you'd say, well, the average effectiveness score of the businesses that were highest performing uh, was at the 80th percentile kind of compared to our 700,000 person norm group. And uh, the opposite was true in the underperforming businesses. Uh, effectiveness scores at the 30th percentile. Big deal, right? Very different. Now. That sets us up for the study. All right, so we just went through a brief overview introduction of the leadership circle profile and model. We think about it this way. Leadership circle as a model, a model of leadership that has access to, it's accessible through the assessment. In other words, we can actually assess ourselves and then find out where do we place ourselves on that model. So how do I show up when I'm on the model? Let me tell you clearly, when I got my first profile about eight or nine years ago, uh, I was not an effective leader. I scored somewhere in the 90th percentile on reactive. I actually thought I was somewhat effective. This is key, why did I think I was effective? I was getting feedback from my environment that I was successful. However, that didn't equate my success and the way results were being measured with whether or not I was actually showing up as an effective leader. That's where that starts to come out, right? That's where it starts to make the dent. So we walk through that so that we have a model that we can assess ourselves on, place it, and that gives us the developmental framework. It was really clear when I took my first profile where my developmental needs were. Not necessarily ones I wanted to play with. I mean, think about this. A highly arrogant person, 90%. Bob and I are sweethearts to be together with 90th percentile arrogance, both of us, right? <laughs> yeah, you should see this conversation over 10 years. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you are one of the most arrogant. You know, I, and I'm like, seriously, there's the shadow. He gives me up. feedback. I say, Bill, this is five standard deviation units above the norm. <laughs> exactly my and point, he goes, right? He goes, yeah. oh, we're playing that out. Yeah, there you go. So finish with my profile, walk home to my... Uh, lovely spouse and uh, put it in front of her and um, was looking for a little bit of sympathy. I don't think I really wanted empathy because obviously her profile is all I could do is aspire towards it. And her response to my profile was, yep. <laughs> and I said, what do you mean, yeah? She said, Bill, that, that's you. Well, yeah, but look at that arrogance and critical score. Exactly. <laughs> right? So it is somewhat uh, pretty, pretty strong medicine. So here's the study. Here's what we did. Uh, Bob, Bob, uh, let me kind of just paint you a little bit of picture of Bob um, on the personal side. This is one of the only people I know that when he's really stressed and he needs to relax, he does spreadsheets. Right? So if Bob's really having a tough week, then he's deep into an Excel. Now, for me, that's a little bit different. We come across this a different style. So True. all of a sudden, we're able to now bring both of these together in this study because what we're doing is we're going after the database with qualitative research, bringing together the quantitative and the qualitative. And the qualitative study that we looked at here and the way that we thought about it is we wanted to do one thing. One, how do leaders describe other leaders? So when you ask questions around effectiveness or areas of improvement, how do leaders describe other leaders? So this is an evaluation of leaders on leaders. And we wanted to be a view from the street. So we wanted to be able to look, from what does it say from those leaders, then they're looking at my leadership or your leadership from down on street level, down on street view. 
And then we want to analyze that norm base of written comments and see, separate out the difference between the highly reactive and the highly creative. This was our 2010 database. So in 2010, we had 17,000 leaders in the database. We took those 17,000 leaders, which was at that point 170,000 evaluators, and we did a matrix content analysis on it. So out of 170,000 evaluators, getting down with the criteria where we could get down to one uh, major executive leadership, so we're talking about CEO, his or her direct reports, their direct reports, and in some cases theirs, the way we think about level one through level four, executive leadership. Larger organizations, at least five direct reports, no more than two leaders per organization. We wanted English speaking, so we didn't have the culture issues, so we went Australia, New Zealand, the US, UK, and Canada, and we took the highly, 100 highly reactive leaders and the 100 highly creative leaders. We sampled for 100 out of that group, and here's how 17,000 to 200. Here, here's how we did it, right? We've, we, we, last time I was here, I introduced the leadership quotient. Right, which is uh, short, shorthand is, it's your top half scores divided by your bottom half scores. A react, uh, creative leadership divided by reactive leadership. If you've got a leadership quotient of one, meaning they're about equal, we think you're normative, you're in the hunt, you're a competitive leader, but uh, leadership quotients less than one are starting to get into competitive disadvantage, leadership quotients greater than one, competitive advantage, and we use this uh, metric to sort the norm base for the highest and lowest, uh, highest uh, creative and highest reactive leaders. And so the LQ is an interesting statistic as we've played with it. Um, it's very highly correlated to leadership effectiveness scores. And it's also very solidly correlated to stage of development from our stage of development study that we talked about earlier. So, and the interesting thing about the LQ is it takes in the whole model, it's the top, entire top half, entire bottom half, takes in the whole model, highly correlated to stage of development. So it's very interesting. And so basically what we did was say, how do, using that metric, we separate it out. And it turns out, this is not a sample of like the very ends of the tails. We sampled 28% on one end, most highly, well on this end would be most highly creative and low reactive. And on the other end, 28% uh, of that norm base. So we're sampling 60% or 56% of our norm base here to say, let's look at what the, those two ends look like in terms of the written comments. Can we see differences in them? Demographics group then, executive leadership, 100 highly reactive, 100 highly creative. This is interesting. 124 males out of the 200, 76 females. So we're looking at a 62% of the database down here was uh, men, and we're then at 38% women. 22% of the highly reactive group were females. 22%. Disproportionately skewed towards women on the creative side. 54% of the highly creative group were female. This now shows our research, validates us at another level. Uh, women are more creative than men, pure and simple. 15 to 20%. Well, I know that's not a big surprise to any of the women sitting in the room. They're going, yeah, well, how long did it take you to get to that? Right, research-wise, I can tell you it's not the way we pay attention to the importance of having diversity in gender and women in leadership. Women are more creative than men, 15 to 20 percentile. Big deal. These differences reflect in the overall database. 176 companies, 29 industries, six countries, and almost 3,000 raters. Now, here's what you got. Here's what we're going to look at in this study. If you take those top three levels, and in some cases, four levels of leadership in a hierarchical organization, big organization, and we look at the most reactive, most creative, what we have here is an extended, what we call the extended leadership team 360 profile over these just under 200 companies. So this is a 360 profile that we're looking at of this extended leadership team over 200 companies. It's amazing, really, when you think about it. And so let's turn toward the comments. Or the aggregate, let's look at the aggregate results first, then we'll get to the comments, all right? So, so given the way we sampled it, we can see some pretty different pretty differences here, and, and, and we did. So here's the aggregate leadership profile of those leaders that were high, high uh, creative, low reactive. So you, you know how to read it just from the, inter like really high creative scores, uh, really low uh, reactive scores, 
and then here's the other group of highly reactive leaders. All right, and if you go back and forth, whoops. If you go back and forth, you can see these are hugely different groups. So the key point in here as we look at this study and we go down to the comments is that these are very, very different groups of leaders. So we're looking at 28% on one side, 28% on the other, but they could not be more different in this way, how they show up as leaders. They are significantly different. We'll talk a little bit more about that, but this is the kicker. They're equal in talent. They've surfaced at the top of this hierarchy in an organization. They are the extended senior leadership team. They're pretty equal in talent. They're pretty equal in domain expertise. They've got the technical background. They're savvy business people. These are talented folks. Highly talented, equal in talent, completely different groups in the way they show up as leaders. And the same is true in the effectiveness score. So if you look at the average, or if you, now this is just another way of sampling this data. So here's the average score in the top half for the creative leaders at the, what, 87th percentile, right? Uh, uh, yeah, 87, and low reactive scores averaging at the 90th percentile compared to our norm base. Not so much uh, very different here with the reactive leaders. Average creative competency scores, 14th percentile. Uh, reactive scores now at the 94th percentile. And so how big are these differences? Are they meaningful? Right? And so statisticians use a metric called effect size to try to measure whether these are meaningful differences. In other words, would they show up, would these differences show up as effectively different in the workplace? And so um, an effect size of less than 0.3, not very meaningful, not really that interesting. By the time you get to 0.8, you're looking at large, practical, meaningful differences. All right, so let's look at the effect sizes here. The effect sizes between the creative scores of these two groups is 4.9. Effect sizes beyond 0.8 are large practical differences. We're at 4.9. And on this, day, this set of data, between their reactive scores, the effect size was 6.4. These groups couldn't be more different in the way they're showing up. And it should have large practical implications. You know, just as an aside as we're going through here, this, this is, uh, as we said, hot, hot off the press. Uh, what Bob and I have seen as we've gone through this presentation is that uh, you're seeing it with us today. Occasionally what's happening is I'm just turning and looking at the slide and going, are you kidding me? Seriously, I need to understand what that really means. So we're entering into an inquiry with you around this data. This is not data that's summarized and finished for us, that we've actually come up with hypotheses and validated them, understand it. We're in that process. So part of it, you're getting our curiosity as we're playing with this, and we're both really, really curious people. Leadership effectiveness on uh, the four, five, five questions we asked, the creative leaders, 87% leadership effectiveness, and the reactive, 10% on the leadership effectiveness scale. And so the effect size here between their scores was 4.37. Huge difference. So we should see these differences in the comments, right? So let's dive let's into the written analysis. Take a look at it. So 900 pages of written comments around these two questions. There's three questions for those who are really familiar with the profile we focused in on two. What's the person's greatest leadership asset, skill, or talent? First question. Second question is what's the greatest leadership challenge or area for development? And then looking at that on the matrix content analysis on those 900 pages, we scored it and sorted into 77 categories. That's what we're doing in a matrix analysis, is categorizing the data. And we came up with 40 leadership strengths and 37, yep, leadership liabilities. And now, we didn't do this. This was done by an independent research company that we hired to do this study. So uh, they came up with the categories and said, these are the themes and strengths, and these are the liabilities we see in this data. Right? Then they calculated what they called an endorsement score, which is how we keep score. How often were these strengths or liabilities mentioned as we went through all this data? And here's how they calculated the endorsement score. So if I'm rating Bill, or there's a group of us rating Bill, and only one rater, me, gives him a score on, say, courage, 
he gets a half a point. One rater rates a leader on uh, one quality, half a point. If three or more raters rate Bill on that same quality, it's a full point. If 10 raters rate him on the same skill, it's still one point, right? So the maximum you can get on a given skill is one, and since you have 100 leaders in each group, the maximum score for any theme, theoretically, would be 100. Following that? So just a quick example. If uh, all 100 leaders are described on courage by three or more people, what would their total score be? 100. And if all 100 leaders were rated on courage by only one rater, what would the collective score be? 50. Great. So you got it. So now right. we'll look at the data. Let's dive in and look at it. Strengths of creative leaders. So this is what comes out, and let's start that with just a representative verbatim quote. Eric is passionate about the business. He loves being creative in his thinking, open to new ideas, driving strategy. So this would get scored on multiple dimensions, strategy, creativity, and so on. And there we go. So here Top are 10 strengths of creative leaders. The on blue the on the left is creative. On my left, on my right, yeah, my Over left. Over there. My left, <laughs> this one, that blue, right? And the right is reactive of the same skills. So these are the top 10 uh, most endorsed skills by creatives, and, I, and then the corresponding scores on those same skills for the reactive leaders. We'll use blue and red throughout the presentation so it's easy to follow. Blue creative, red reactive, and you can just kind of walk down the list. Strong people skills, look at the difference there. Number one on the list. Huge difference. Well, and obviously the difference as well as 79. 79 on the creative. Think about that. Max scores 100. So 79% of these leaders got endorsed strongly, actually, for um, people skills. Vision, personable, approachable, leads by example, a lot of passion and drive. We'll talk about the difference here. They lumped passion and drive together, but they also saw that reactive leaders, they said, were more driven, creative leaders more passionate, and the distinction there was passion has to do more with mission, with impact with service the organization is trying to provide to the world and to others, and driven is more about my own uh, drive to make things happen and my own ambition. Um, okay, so you got so, a sense for it. So we're gonna, in your- before you, before you do that, Bob, so that when you look at these, what you're gonna see is you've got two different uh, pages of this there on the top 10 strengths, and uh, these are the words that come out of the content analysis. So in other words, this is the view from the street on how leaders describe other leaders. These are the words they use. These are where the categories came from. And you have these descriptions in your bag in a handout. So I'd like you to pull that out and uh, find a, turn to a partner, somebody near you, twos, maybe threes. Um, and you're gonna have three minutes to read the handout, look at the you know definitions, how are these things described? We have this on the screen, and uh, the question you might discuss is, uh, so what? What's, what strikes us when we look at this list and these definitions? Yeah, what does this mean? What does this mean? So, three minutes.
these guys are working on the target. Okay, one more minute. Take one more minute. Come on back, pause your conversation, or not, <laughs> we, will, <laughs> we will put you in another conversation with your partner here uh, shortly. So there's a lot here, isn't there? We don't have time to kind of collect your, your insights, but there's a lot here. So here's an example, right? Strengths a creative leader. Mary inspires people to enjoy working harder and smarter. She fosters an incredible team atmosphere, and she does it while maintaining strong sense of honesty and directness opposed to just a rah-rah type leader. She's not afraid to point out areas that need improvement, so when she endorses others' ideas, that person feels really a true sense of accomplishment and strong desire to do it again. You get the people skills in there, uh, and as we'll be talking about, you get a both-and quality to these cr uh, creative leaders. They can challenge in a supportive way, and that's a very... Uh, powerful Well, and there's such a wonderful thing uh, that happens here when you look at the verbatim comment that someone gives Mary about her leadership and what that can do to reinforce where she is and what she can build upon and also what she can do to improve. It's a wonderful thing, this thing called feedback that's so underutilized and so necessary. Let's look at the strengths of reactive leaders. Starting that out with another verbatim. Uh, this is one of our personal favorites. Paul's greatest strength, now, now let's not contrast Paul to Mary. I mean, let's not do that. Paul's greatest strength in his key mind is his key mind. He is absolutely brilliant and has a powerful, somewhat unique, combination of technical savviness, business acumen, and a reptilian charisma. Love that. Right? Now, let's go back to Mary for a moment and think about Mary and Paul working together. This is a great combination, the two of them, because they could almost have a full leader given how much Paul takes away. So right here on reactive leadership, right here on reactive leadership as we look at these strengths and the way that Paul is being measured is technically savvy, he's powerful, he's smart. He's bringing these things to the table. In fact, we could venture a guess and not be very far off that these got him promoted up in the organization pretty darn rapidly. Right? These are core skills. So here's the list in red, rank ordered here, of the highest uh, reactive strengths in the, and, and contrasted with how creative leaders were measured on those same strengths. And uh, we switched the language here to drive and passion, from passion and drive because of that distinction. But uh, highly endorsed here at 61, even more strongly than uh, creative leaders. Visionary, uh, pretty strong strategic direction, visionary type, Stuff, not as strong as uh, creatives, and then the stuff Bill was hitting. You got technical domain knowledge, results focused, intelligent, brilliant, people skills further down the list, and not very highly endorsed, actually, at 28. Um, very creative, innovative, personable, approachable, positive attitude. So, you know, you look at that and you think about those strengths as of reactive leaders, that's a really fine list. These are amazing strengths. And the same notion in here on the endorsement, even on the top strengths of reactive leaders, creative leaders were endorsed 1.3 times more often. Yeah, and we, forgot, we, we actually forgot to mention on the earlier when we were looking at creative leader strengths, 2.3 times more often than reactive leaders. Here on the things that creative leaders are most uh, strong on, uh, or reactive leaders are most strong on, creative leaders are still more endorsed at 1.3 times more often. So when you get to continue the qualitative research in here, one of the next questions that comes out is, all right, what are the gaps? So if we look at those gaps between creative and reactive, their leadership strengths, what shows up? What are the major gaps? And check these out. These are very different groups of leaders. 
very, very different. So if I were to walk around, a lot of them are here at people. You got some here on integrity, calm demeanor, and so on. Um, uh, it, it, it's a, a vision and integrity and uh, over here. So you've got a nice spread, but clearly a balance over on the more relating and self-awareness type of uh, dimensions. Well, and, and think about this as a pathway for development. I mean, uh, as a somewhat reformed high on bill, I'm a reactive leader, right? There's a pathway in here for me of what I know makes a difference in leadership. And so then we say to ourselves, well, so what? One, this is a description of the street on reactive and creative leadership, effective leadership. That's really important. We're not the ones making this up. This is leaders describing what works and what doesn't and the impact of that. We were really surprised by the predominance on the relationship side. We were really surprised. I mean, when we got it, this was about two weeks ago now, a little over two weeks ago. The, the, then we were surprised by how surprised we were. Like, why, why were we Seriously. so surprised? That, yeah. that Wait a minute. Were, were you surprised, Bob? Yeah, I was really surprised. Really? Why were we so surprised? Because we've been looking through a quantitative lens at leadership effectiveness with a profile. So when more I do, than we have qualitatively. And so all of a sudden, when we made this shift in there between leadership effectiveness and business performance, how do you measure that quantitatively? That lens shifted for us. Quantitative and qualitative tell two different stories that come together to make a complete story. So when I'm de-stressing and running spreadsheets, it's pretty clear to me that um, when you do the uh, correlation analysis, achieving scores, results, strategy, focus, all that stuff, are higher, uh, much higher, are cor correlated than relating scores. Not much higher, but higher. Right? And then you're going to put them in a regression equation together, and achieving takes up most of the explanation of what makes for an effective leader, and that's always made sense to me. I mean, this is a business, and it's not a marriage survey, so um, getting results uh, makes sense that that would be the most highly correlated and pick up most of the variation on leadership effectiveness. But when we look at the comments, it's skewed exactly the other way. Well, and you raise this, uh, you see the predominance on the people side, and you say to yourself, uh, you know, bottom line, not something that's new to us at knowing, it's something that's new to us in practice, is effective leadership is about leading people, pure and simple. Doesn't mean you don't have to have the other skills, capabilities, you do, but it's about leading people. And here's where it plays itself out. Being effective relationship at scale is non-negotiable. Play this one out. So I, as a leader, get a promotion. All of a sudden, I have another 1,000 people in my organization, another 500. How do I get in relationship with that additional 1,000 people or the two or 3,000 people that report to me? I have to scale relationship if I'm going to grow in leadership. If I'm going to actually be able to scale my organization and grow my organization, I have to scale my leadership. Relationship we, is one component of that. When we met with Peter Harmer, the one on the video here, he talked a lot about that. Yeah, Peter talked about the way he's scaling leadership and relationship. He said, we have our uh, executive team meeting once a month. Uh, the next day, we get on and we have a uh, Cisco meeting. Uh, we give 20 minutes, and then after we're done with 20 minutes of that, we do question and answers, and then we take all the question and answers that we don't get to in the last 10 minutes. I mean, think about 15,000 people, all the questions and answers we don't get to in the last 10 minutes, and by the next 24 or 36 hours, we've answered all those directly. Online. I want to be in direct relationship with all my people. I want them to know that I'm there. That's a hell of a commitment for a CEO of a major corporation. And then, of course, passion, vision, top the list, and uh, the two most highly correlated dimensions of leadership effectiveness on the survey are purposeful visionary, number one, and teamwork, number two. When you put those together, you're aligning stakeholders around uh, key direction, and that's, uh, you see that in the comments. All right, now. Now we get to have some fun, right? Yeah, this was a, this was a surprise. I was playing around, and I just said, I wonder what the smallest gaps are. Ran a spreadsheet. And uh, this is what came out, right? Bob doesn't have jet lag. He just does spreadsheet. <laughs> so this is gaps of five or less. Look at this list. Strong networker, domain technical knowledge, results focused, analytical, good problem solver, thorough, continu uh, continuous improvement, and really hardworking. Both groups equally endorsed on these skills. And as I thought about it, so these don't differentiate the very best leaders 
from the most reactive leaders. These are non-differentiating, at least if we just look at the comments. Yeah, so non-differentiating has an interesting connotation to it when you play this one out. And you take right in the middle there, non-differentiating, strong network domain, technical knowledge, and results focused, and you say to yourself, uh, when you work your way down this list, these are entry stakes. This is the gateway in to be a leader at this level. This is just base. This is the expectation. You don't even get to play in the game if you can't be good at these. Not that they're unimportant. They're critically important. Uh, they just don't differentiate leadership. So if you're leading with your creative brilliance, your uh, keen intellect, your unique competency and capability, uh, your industry domain savvy, and so on, um, that's great. It's necessary, and it can really contribute, but it isn't leadership. So you take those non-differentiating strengths, and you look at the top of the reactive, the top 10, and right in the middle you see three of the top five are non-differentiators. Three of the top five. It's a given. It's expected. And then if we take those three out, three more bump up to the list. You got a few more added to the bottom. And, but the difference now between uh, differentiating strengths are quite large at 1.7x. So creative leaders on this list of strengths are evaluated one point. And this is, the, this is the reactive top of the list of differentiating strengths. And even so, creative leaders are much more strongly endorsed. So when we look at creative leader list, we get a 2.3x. On this list, we get a 1.7x. Uh, you're looking at two-fold difference in terms of how, overall, in terms of how uh, creative leaders are endorsed on strengths that really define leadership. So what? First one right off the bat, we've talked about it. These reactive and creative leaders at the top of the organization in this way are equally talented. And when we look at this data for us, at some level it gives us more complete picture and redefines effective leadership. Non-differentiating strengths are necessary, but they're not sufficient. They're necessary. They get us in the door, but they're not sufficient. What got you here won't take you where you're going. It won't get you there. And this one that uh, came out really early for me, um, I, I was born and raised on a cattle ranch, family business, and my father used to talk about this all the time. How you get results is as important as the results themselves. Now, I didn't appreciate that when I was a kid working on the ranch because I thought he was telling me on how to get results, not just get results. Oh, yeah, he was. He was. He was trying to teach me a lesson in there, and how I get results is as important as results themselves. If you shortcut things, you got a problem. If you're not treating people with the dignity and respect that they deserve and the results you get is over top of them, you got a problem, Bill. He was teaching me those lessons at an early age, and lo and behold, it shows up in the research. So let's look at the liability list. Uh, in this case, we'll look at reactive leaders. So here's a good example. Will seems a bit disconnected on a personal level from those that he should be mentoring. While I know he is often pressed for time, I suggest that he strive to connect with those in the organization and be willing to share some of himself to develop a bond with them so that they will want to follow him. Will undervalues the power of relationships and the synergies that those relationships can create in accomplishing his vision and those of others. He tends to go it alone instead of working to figure out how to combine the resources and efforts with his peers to be able to accomplish and expand the vision. Top 10 liabilities of reactive leaders. Compared now with... Now we're turning the corner. Compared with, on the blue, the, the same liabilities as seen uh, through effect, uh, an effective uh, creative leaders. And the endorsement score in here, 6.5 times more often than creative leaders. So just get this picture, because this is a big picture, and I want us to get the compassion of what means for leaders feeling like they're over their head at scale. This is a big deal. Are you kidding? We got in. I thought that's what it took. No, that just starts the game. We're just now in the game. We're on the field. We have to learn how to play. Ineffective interaction style, 63 to 6. Not a team player, 42 to 3. Team not fully developed, 
over demanding, micromanages. I won't ask you to raise your hand. Does anybody know a leader? Or are they that leader? I know I was. Now I understand a little bit about what it means to be a control freak when I look at this and the way that actually plays out in the leaders look at leaders. Plays its way down. Team not held accountable, inattentive, poor listener, too self-centric, lacks emotional control, and impatient. You take those in combination with the strengths and some interesting stuff happens here. So you have on your handout the definitions and the language that was used by leaders in describing these. Uh, same thing, three minutes with a partner. Uh, we'll put this list uh, up on the screen and um, talk about it. What, what strikes you? What do you notice? Three minutes. Have at it. One more minute, one more minute. Come on back. There's a workshop here, not just a, as Pete Block used to say, workshops are meaningful discussions interrupted by lecture. So there you go. All right. So liabilities react to leaders. Here's another one of our verbatims. This is a longer one. Um, Pietro's Raider had a lot to say. Uh, this is one person talking about Pietro. Pietro has an extremely high problem solving ability, which is key to his effectiveness in building a compelling strategy and roadmap. At times, the strength can result in Pietro getting, love this, in quotations, getting too much into the details and doing the work that would typically be expected of his direct reports or his teams. In order to most effective, be most effective in his role as president, Pietro should strive to be rigorous in task assignment and ensuring the right people are doing the right work, which builds collaboration, consensus, and creates developmental coaching opportunities slash coaching opportunities for teams if there's an identified skill gap. 
Pietro is extremely intelligent, typically gets to the solution before anybody else does. Smartest one often, in the room. He's smart and brilliant. President, uh, this is often his downfall as he moves quickly implementing a solution when in fact the organization is two steps back. This can create insecurity, frustration, and people feel they cannot live up to his expectations. He does not leverage the team to create the vision because he's so intelligent and he gets the answer so, uh, so much faster than most. He loses patience and de uh, decides to do all the work himself, missing out on the input of others, failing to garner support for his vision. And we're now just warming up. Right? We just gave you all the strengths. Now let's talk a little bit, Pietro, about the liabilities. Pietro can also become quickly entrenched in his position and often ignores valid input and alternate points of view. He thinks he knows best, he doesn't listen to others, and he does not inspire confidence in his team. As a result, his professional arrogance, nice way to put it, Cindy didn't do that for me, creates more of a dictatorial, thanks honey, she's watching, creates more of a dictatorial <laughs> leadership style, which in turn produces adversarial relationships internally. Pietro versus everyone. So you all got it, that are in the consulting business or a leader, the entire team has one common enemy. Who is it? Pietro. Yeah, that's a great way for team to come together as we know. And over time, this outcome will also spread to external partners. It doesn't just spread to my team. He gives, he's a giving guy. In the end, we'll continue to lose talent, which will eventually impact business performance. Now, this is interesting. There's no question in my mind that Pietro has the best intentions of the world to do nothing but great, great results. And when he gets under pressure, what shows up? Right? Goes the opposite direction. This is where the liabilities okay. play I really, out. Uh, when I read this, it really touched me, actually, because, um, I mean, I have a lot of those same skills. A lot of those same strengths. I mean, there's a lot of strength here. Tons right? of strength. Uh, around analytics and numbers and quick and stuff. But, um, you know, you look at my 360, it's a different story on control and arrogance and so on. So you lead with that stuff, uh, it's, not, it's not effective. All right, so here are the biggest gaps. Here are the biggest gaps, right? Not a surprise here, it's really the same list, but look at the gap on interaction style, minus 57. Team play, not, uh, minus uh, uh, 39 and so on. These are big gaps between the two. And look at the bottom on the other side. No challenges were mentioned 57% of the time uh, uh, for creative leaders. It either wasn't mentioned, there were no, no challenges mentioned, or they actually said, I can't think of anything. So you play that one out with the endorsement scores? on creative leaders and reactive leaders. 1,113 strengths on the creative side to liabilities of 255. On the reactive side, 593 strengths to 667 liabilities. This is based on all the categories now, not just the top 10, right? Yeah. All the categories. If you add them all up, this is the, how it looks. This starts to give us some really, really stunning results. 4.4 to 1 ratio on the creative side, and then check this out. 0.9 to 1. So my strategy as a highly reactive leader, I'm talking personally here, was always more, harder, faster. Right? Major controller. Major driver. Uh, just add that off with a little perfectionism. Again, a real sweetheart. <laughs> All I have to do is amp up. A little bit harder, more, harder, faster. That is the strategy. Right on the consulting business, what's one more client? 20-hour days? Wait a minute. What's my return on that ratio? of 0.9 to 1. It doesn't matter how much harder I work, how much more time I put in. If I come out of that perspective, it's a 0.9 to 1 ratio. I'm getting diminishing returns on my own effectiveness as a leader. Versus a multiple, right? 4.4 4. 4 to 1. This is a question we play with. What's the ratio on your leadership? What's the ratio on our leadership? What are we getting out of that ratio on our leadership? You know, I know that if I take a very simple example as a leader, leadership at scale, we'll talk a little bit more about that, and that example is time. If I'm not getting a multiple on time spent as a leader, especially as I'm moving up in the organization, then I can't scale the organization. I can't grow it. Am I getting a one-to-one -one ratio? I'm getting to a 10-to-one, a 20-to-one, a 30-to-one, a 50-to-one, 100-to-one? What's the ratio on your leadership? How do you scale it? 
So we then looked at it a little differently. We said, what's the net of strengths minus liabilities? So if we take strengths and subtract off liabilities on both sides, what do we get? Well, on the creative side, you get a very large pile of net strengths at 858 and net liabilities at 70, minus 74 on the create, uh, reactive side, right? So then we said, well, let's pull the non-differentiating strengths out of that. Now we got 697 to 255. It gives you some sense of net strength. So the question becomes, are you getting a multiple? Back one, Bill. Are you getting a multiple or are you canceling yourself out? So we came to affectionately call this the canceling effect. Wow. Check the reactive out. side across the board. You know, what we take here, top 10 reactive strengths offset by top 10 reactive liabilities. Strengths and liabilities. Now remember, equally talented group of people. This is not about judging them. These are strengths. These are core strengths. But when my liabilities and my strengths become equal, what happens? Drive and passion, 61. The liability, ineffective interaction style, 63. And total. work your way down. Total them all up, they're about the same total. So you got about a one-to-one -one correspondence between reactive strength, reactive liability. We call this, you're canceling yourself out. How many times have we heard, Bill, people say, oh, she, she Man, can't, get can't, in, can't get out of her own can't way. Can't get out of his own way. The, uh, uh, keep shooting themselves in the foot. I can't believe they're canceling themselves out. Did you believe that conversation we just had that just completely undid everything that we've done for three weeks? My favorite was he or she keeps stepping on a rake. <laughs> <laughs> right? <laughs> Yeah, well, Bob knows that I feel the pain of that every time. It's like, damn, that rake is still on the front lawn, right? So let's play this out another level and talk about seven key leadership multiple and canceling effects as we start to wind up the study. So we didn't pull these out. The researchers pulled these out uh, and handed them to us. So here's the, you know, all these. We're going to show you a bunch of graphics are all the same. So this has to do with people skills, strong people skills versus ineffective interaction style. So the creatives in blue, really strongly endorsed on people skills, on an effective interaction style, not much there. Big multiple on your leadership here, right? Whereas uh, strong people skills on reactive, 28, versus an effective interaction style, 63, big canceling effect. So are you getting a multiple, are you canceling yourself out? On people skills, big difference here between these two. Sorry. Teamwork, same thing. Big differentiator for effective leaders, canceling effect um, for uh, reactive leaders. Look at the next one. Developing people in teams, develops people, canceling effect, liability, hasn't fully developed the team. Empowerment, empowers others, micromanages. Listening, whoops. Dueling. We're dueling. Exactly. Over control. I think you won. Micromanaging. <laughs> Composure. Yep. And the last one, servant leadership. Now let's play this out. This is where we started working it. And we're asking ourselves the question, does your leadership scale? And the answer is, on a highly reactive structure, strengths become liabilities. We talk a little bit about that, about removing the core gift. And at the very time I need more scale in my leadership, I actually remove the gift from the table. The more harder, faster for a controller like me, doesn't get the results I'm looking for. Leadership at scale is required. Great leaders build the capacity and the capability of their organizations. They're consistently building capacity and capability. Gifts hung on, a, hung on a reactive structure don't scale. They produce more liability, 0.9 to 1, than they give you the ratio or the multiple on your leadership impact. Bottom line. So the question we started to play with in here, and... <laughs> really worked, and this goes back into, for anyone in here that 
remembers earlier on in their work, Bob and I are both 60, <laughs> about to be 61, born in the same year, and uh, we're competing on that one too. Um, you all remember the uh, conversation of the Peter Principle, right? Peter Principle is a principle basically says that you'll raise to your highest level of incompetence, right? So you hit a ceiling at whatever level of incompetence, which becomes the selection criteria. Ah, uh, they've hit the Peter Principle. I can remember this early on in my career. They've hit the Peter Principle. What does that mean? Well, they've hit their own level of incompetence. The question we have is they may have not hit their own level of incompetence. They may have hit their own level of development. Have they hit their level of development? So are they actually not structured for the complexity and the task at hand for what's being required of them? And that's a developmental lens on leadership. Most of our lens on leadership has been on the outer game, skills, competencies, uh, behaviors, training, focus. Uh, much less focus on development and the way that we talked about the various operating systems that uh, as they evolve become more complex and more adapted for the challenges that leaders are facing. So we think creative or higher is required for the kind of complexity we're in. So if you look at that uh, smorgasbord of uh, uh, canceling effects and um, multiples, is this merely a matter of skill? Or is there something deeper going on? Is it, is it wired into the operating system? And what could happen if you uh, got real breakthroughs at that level? And think about 28% of my extended leadership team is playing on one end of the spectrum and 28% on the other end. How collectively effective is that? And what could happen if we could really break through? And so when we come back, we're gonna play with the developmental lens, with the, with the hypothesis um, uh, uh, this, that when you run your strengths, your gifts, and remember these are equally talented people, through a reactive structure of mind, uh, you remove the gift. Take it off the table, cancel it out. Uh, you introduce competing liabilities. And it um, doesn't scale. It doesn't scale. So how often do you hear, uh, oh, you know what, they've become the bottleneck. Can't get decisions made. <laughs> They're actually holding us up. We can't grow. Why? Well, they've constricted the system. Same thing when we look at creative strengths. Those strengths run on a reactive structure of mind. It creates a multiple. It leverages complementary competencies, leverages strengths, mastery of leadership, and it scales leadership. So that's where we've got so far in this research of making sense out of it. And that's the study. We're going to come back after the break, which you have how long? Four and a half. And we'll talk about developmental ends. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.